You're listening to the Teak Nation Podcast, where we strive to educate, inspire, and entertain you with tips and lessons from frauders and friends of TKE. Good day to you, Teak Nation. My name is Alex Swenson. I am with Donnie Aldrich for the first time in what feels like six years, but we've only been doing this podcast for nine months, so it has not been that long. But Donnie's back. Uh, we've been separated for a while now, amicably separated, but we, we decided to, to, to try this little back and forth again. I decided. Right. So we have not been on the pod together. We have been. I haven't together. seen you since July. That's that's not accurate. Let's not lie to the listeners out there. We have loyal listeners who are also many of them members of the organization. Let's be honest. I think it's pretty safe to assume all of them are members of the organization. I know that you like to downplay and almost insult our listeners. There are folks that possibly listen to this podcast that are not members. We have loyal listeners that are non-teaks. Well, my mom probably. Yeah, and that's a start. And I don't insult the listeners. I just wish there were more of them. Right, I but it's say, not, I don't say listeners, you suck. I say I basically say people who don't listen suck. Right, but there are many people I've met in my life that think a leadership trait to uh, get growth is to insult the people who are currently not growing, and I I don't know that that's I don't know that that's the way to go about it. There are many different ways to lead. That's true. You could be Machiavelli. You could be mm, uh, Logan, Logan Roy from Succession. Timely reference. Actually, yep. Machiavelli and Logan Roy are, are very, very similar. You could be Mother Teresa. Yeah, I, I think that you have you need to inspire and you need to educate people. And there's some folks that need a little kick in the backside. That's always a good thing. But just insulting and then thinking that that's going to get people to turn around. Usually that's not effective. Usually is the one man's thing. opinion. All right. So we're, we're podcasting today. It is just the two of us. No guests this week. Uh, thought since we had not been together for a podcast episode in quite some time that we could just catch up, check in on a few things, recap some of the previous episodes. I know uh, maybe you're listening right now and thinking, F that I'm out. Uh, maybe you're listening right now and thinking, gosh, I really missed Donnie and Alex's back and forth banter. Well, I got good news. There's more of it coming. So with that being said, where should we start? There's so many things to catch up on that we're never going to get to all of them. But if you had to make a list of things that we need to catch our listeners up on and talk about on the Teak Nation podcast, what would be at the top of that list? I think it's relevant, not just to my own uh, future employment, but also to the organization that we discussed the fact that we have a new Grand Preakness. Burr, burr, burr. Um, that was a DJ air horn. Yes, we do have a new Grand Preakness. That happened probably a month ago now, right? Oh, more towards six weeks ago. Six it was directly ago. after the last council meeting. We're getting ready to go to another council meeting. That's right. Where we talked to Bruce Melcher, past Grand Preetness, which was the last time that we were on the podcast together. Uh, yes, we do have a new Grand Preetness that most of you slash all of you likely know by now. But Frater Ted Barriswell has taken over for Dr. James Hickey. Dr. Hickey's doing well. There are no uh, weird secret backroom goings on that caused this to happen. The statement that was released on teak.org pretty much covered everything. Frauder Jim has a lot of different obligations going on in his life right now and needed to take a step back. So it was sad for all of us. He, he actually came to the office to tell us in person, which I thought was a, a nice touch. But uh, moving forward with Frauder Ted, it's going to be it's going to be a roller coaster. I'm looking forward to this grand council meeting this week. Yeah, I, I think everyone out there, all jokes aside, should have complete comfort and excitement about Frauder Ted Bearswell taking over as the Venerable Grand Prix. He has been extremely involved in many conversations and leadership decisions over the last six, eight years, but especially in the last two years between myself and discussions with, with Dr. Hickey. He, he just, it's going to provide a lot of stability. And he's also someone that has deep respect for the work that the professional staff does, that our volunteers do, that our chapters, our chapter leaders are out there continuing to strive to advance the mission of the fraternity. Ted is completely focused on those pieces and the initiatives that we've all been working towards over the last number of years. Ted is going to champion those and he's going to foster their continued growth. And so the, the greatest thing I can say is Ted is going to ensure that things 
continue to progress forward. I, I don't expect uh, a sudden sea change in terms of direction. Ted feels really good about the organization and, and a lot of work that's going on. People who are listening to this podcast, the impact that you're making, and he just wants to, to put more fuel on it and, and spur further growth. And he's a huge proponent of always looking to get better. Nothing, it, nothing is ever good enough. And how can we reach our potential? So I'm excited about where he's going to take us and the work that he's going to do as he continues in his tenure in service to the Grand Council. Yeah, I I, I agree completely. I uh, I was more just I was referring to the fact that we have never well at least that since I'm aware changed the Grand Preakness in the middle of October before, and so that process has been very different in our office and with the Grand Council. I know, but I think they've done as good of a job as you could possibly do in, in that situation. And um, I think we've tried to be very communicative about what was going on and how it was going. Ted has decades of professional experience, decades of experience serving on boards that are non-teak related, that are teak related, been involved with the foundation. Um, he's He's got all the, the requisite chops, so to speak, to do a fantastic job. So I am looking forward. We do, I mentioned we have a grand council meeting coming up this week. I, I'm looking forward to it because I I just want, I want to see where he, where he takes us and, and what his plan is. And I think we all have a pretty good idea of what that is, but um it's always, it's always a, a change switching Grand Prix and I, and I don't think this will be any different. So um, I know Ted's going to probably try and get to some RLCs, shake some hands, see some smiling faces. That'll be exciting having him there as, as Grand Preetness. Do we want to transition right into the RLCs? Actually, I'd be remiss if I didn't say a few words as well about J.P. Fitzgerald. He's someone who is a member of the Grand Council that simultaneous with Dr. Hickey retiring because of many professional developments, uh, many professional commitments that he had. Simultaneous, J.P. Fitzgerald also stepped aside. It, the timing actually worked out with his commitment to USA Baseball. He's someone who's been very involved in USA Baseball. And as you can imagine, over the last two years while he's been serving on the council, there hasn't been a lot of travel with with COVID and, and restrictions, those are starting to open up. And now USA Baseball is going to start traveling around the world. Uh, and JP has a young family. And obviously with that commitment to USA Baseball, it just he wasn't able to commit to the fraternity the same way that he's committed to USA Baseball. And so I know some folks knew JP, a lot of folks who don't know JP, but someone who was very committed, uh, came into the fraternity a few years ago as an honorary member uh, and was, was signed on as an at-large member of the Grand Council because of his perspective, because of his outside thought process in terms of let's look at the fraternity from the outside versus some of us who have been in it since we were 18 years old and give us fresh perspective and give us thought on different directions and initiatives and strategic moves that we're making. And I just consider him not only a good friend, but also someone who really provided value over the past couple of years and someone who I know you really have enjoyed getting to know as well. Well, he's a Sox fan, and any any Red Sox fan is always welcome with open arms and my personal social service. So keep that in mind out there, listeners. There's there's your in. Um, but yeah, I, uh, it is. Uh, it's always unfortunate when someone has to step down in the middle of their term. But um, just the fact that JP came into the fraternity a few years ago, actually at an RLC um, in Jersey City. Some of you listening may have been there to witness it. I know I was. But um, the fact that he came to the fraternity a few years ago and, and stepped right onto the Grand Council and, and offered that perspective and just like you talked about as, as somebody who operates and functions at a very high level, but had not had not done so within the confines of this fraternity, it was a it was a unique situation. I something I think something just to learn about life in general is add perspectives, like whether it's your own life or whether it's your business or your, your family or whatever that is, it never hurts to have more perspective in the proverbial pot. It's up to you to filter those perspectives and determine which ones are valuable and which ones are going to lead to success. But getting some of that wisdom from JP coming in from the outside, not again, not something that we've had on the Grand Council, maybe as much as as a Grand Council would have liked. So um, absolutely good to good to get to know him and spend time with him. I'm sure we will see him again at some point in the future. Big, big turnover. I'm not running for Grand Council. I know there are some spots open. I don't know about you, Donnie, but uh, it, it might be an opportunity for some of our listeners to. to right. I, I wouldn't say him. big. I wouldn't say big turnover. There's two two members who, who have stepped aside, and I know one one position's already been filled by Shimmy Meta, another alumnus that we've gotten to know that's had a lot of success, and so we're excited that he is joining the Grand Council. And then there's one open spot, and they're going through the process right now of 
of navigating interviews and navigating the process of how we bring on that final at-large member onto the Grand Council. Yes, sir. And then there was obviously some, some shifting within the Grand Council as well, which you can read about at your own leisure. All right, where to next? RLCs, recruitment, conclave? Sure, let's go to RLC. I'm, I will take your direction. Well, we, uh, we, we have RLC registration live. I just saw Alex Baker walk in the room behind you. I'm not sure if he's still there. He did a fantastic job on the website. Uh, okay, never mind. The website's okay. Um, he, <laughs> um, RLC registration's live. And, and, and it's important to note because we didn't do RLCs in a traditional sense last year. And a lot of our members have no idea what they are. A lot of our members probably don't even know what RLC stands for, Regional Leadership Conference. With all that being said, I know a lot of the listeners, the loyal listeners that we love and respect and value and cherish um, are volunteers and are, are individuals who have regular interactions with our collegiate members. We have to keep in mind, we are, we are reteaching people in a lot of ways how to ride a bike, how to swim, because that skill has been lost in the last two years. RLCs haven't happened since February of 2020. We need to have a conversation about what they are before we start getting people to agree to attend them. And that's something that we're talking about a lot at the office, how we're going to frame those conversations. We're looking forward to having 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 individuals attend across the four sites. We need to, we need to remember we need to, to meet our members where they are right now, which is a lot of the leaders are, are going to be coming in in the next year. Sophomores and juniors didn't have a chance to attend regional leadership conferences in 2020, might not have any idea what goes on there or how they can make the most use of that time. Let's have those conversations now before December 10th, before January 10th, before these registration deadlines. So we're not trying to educate people on what the heck these things are at the same time that we're trying to sell them on why it's important to attend. I agree. And What's interesting about the pandemic and, and one of the effects of it is RLCs have really been a staple of our, our members' experience for the last 20 years and something that was a conversation point each year around RLC registration and essentially the more veteran members in the chapter or colony communicating with the new members, here's what RLC is, here's why you should go. And then whenever they would go, they would have a great experience. And then of course they would pass that down. And so we were lucky enough that some folks saw such a great experience that they wanted to invest in it year after year after year. And that's what we want to see longer term as we continue to move the program ahead. But it is something for those folks who haven't attended or haven't tuned in, you're listening into the podcast, something that is a dynamic event for two days and really a chance for you to shift your perspective. Al just talked about perspective with JP. So shift your perspective on the organization. When you talk all the time, when you join of you're part of this big organization, almost 300,000 members now total initiated and we're on you know, approaching 235 campuses across North America. We're all over the place and, and such a, a large moving ship you don't feel that at times when you're on your campus and in your chapter issues and your local challenges that you have each day and your goals you're looking to accomplish. When you go to an RLC, you really get that perspective and you get to be around groups that are bigger than you in many cases. You get to be around groups that are struggling and smaller than you in many cases and get to have those conversations about how they have risen or how they have met challenges. And you get to have that peer to peer conversation. Simultaneously, you get to meet folks who you're reading about in the TK guide. You get to read about some of these legendary leaders uh, on the Grand Council. Some, there's times where you get to see a, a Bruce Melcher or you may get to see a Steve Forbes if you're in New York City and see some of these, these notable alumni. And then you get to engage with what I consider people who are just as legendary that are not as highly profiled, and that are our volunteers and local alumni who engage in some of these events and attend. And you get to see how Fraternity for Life exists and, and its true living form of members who are still engaged with the organization and still looking to advance our mission and champion our values. And that's what makes it such a, a great event. And, and then frankly, you know, programming is a staple of this organization, something we take a lot of pride in. You get to be around people who are who have a great ability to tap into your greatness and your excellence and draw it out. And they're going to challenge you. They're going to put you in positions to reflect upon are the things you're doing 
and the things you're acting upon, who you say you are. Is your group operating in the ways that it should to be the most efficient, to be the best on your campus? And if you're the best on your campus, how can you be the best in your province? If you're the best in your province, how can you be the best in your region? If you're the best in the region, how can you be the best in Teak Nation? And so really stacking all of that up and figuring out what's the flight plan to get me from the current location I'm in to where I want to get to. And that's a, the great piece about RLC. And the last thing I would say is you get to build all these relationships and connection points with either staffers, volunteers, or other collegiates, folks you can call upon after you leave the RLC. And, and also it opens a lot of doors for people to go to the Leadership Academy or to go to a conclave and to really get excited and jazzed up about the magnificent obsession that is TKA. You might also get to meet uh, Donnie Aldrich or Alex Swinson, which is. I would focus on Alex Swinson. That's a that's a that's a get. I mean, well, that's I, I the conversations to, that you will be able to have with people. I tend to insulate myself pretty well at those. So there's multiple well, layers you need to get through to, to get to me, but it is possible. I don't want to put it outside the realm of possibility. What's great is you used to play a role in the back of the room. And so you were very focused on the logistics and the curriculum of the event. Now, because of your ascension into oh. a more elevated position in the organization, you're more front-facing and have a little more time to be able to engage with the frauders and engage with our groups because it's your job to make sure they are operating efficiently and also helping our groups to grow. I feel like I should be writing some of this stuff down. Um, it's great. It's recorded, so it's great. You can watch it later and take notes. I could be a loyal listener of the Teak Nation podcast. I'll think about it. Light bulb going off right above your head right now. Yeah. That's great. Um, early bird deadline, December 10th. If you're going to register, I would encourage you to do so by that point. Alumni pricing is, uh, alumni volunteer pricing is discounted throughout the entire registration period. So um, there is a discounted double rate for alumni. The other thing that we have done intentionally is added incentive to send more people. The more people you send to the RLC, the lower the per person price is. We want officers, new members, chairs, general members. The, the groups that take away the most from the RLC are not the groups that send two guys and uh, and then end up, you know, they, they sit together at every session and they sit together at ritual and they only talk to each other during meals and then they go home. You might learn a thing or two, but you're not going to get the same experience as a chapter that sends 12 or 16 and they can send two guys to every session or so they can send four guys to every session. They can go meet chapters from all over the country and go talk to every grand council member and then walk away with all new perspectives and all new information. So that was done very purposefully. We want to see groups send eight, send 12, send 16, send 30 if they can, because that's how you maximize the experience. That is how you get the most out of the regional leadership conferences. And there is financial incentive to increase that registration. Number. So something else to keep in mind as we have those conversations. Moving on, uh, any reflections from the last two episodes, which have been recruitment focused? Uh, two episodes ago, we talked about the recruitment rankings and who was the top there. And then last episode was a ton of fun talking to the guys from Auburn. I think that there are so many valuable lessons to learn from a group like Auburn that has come from a handful of guys to now one of the most powerful groups in terms of manpower in the organization. I also always want to continue to promote Fired Up. I think it's a dynamic program that we've made investments in. We've seen, saw your last report, over 644 people have completed it this year and would love to see that number get up to 1,644 people who have completed that program because it's going to make you better in terms of recruiting, but it's also going to make you better in terms of your, your ability to sell yourself which is going to help you when it comes to get landing jobs. It's also going to help you in your ability, uh, even just socially and in your community as you continue to evolve and get engaged with different passionate areas in your life. Uh, that ability to constantly communicate an idea and to be able to share the research behind it, but also your ability to connect with other folks and, and be able to uh, win friends and influence people. I believe that's a, that's a book. So if it's not, you should write it. Yeah, I think Dale Carnegie beat me to that. Uh, but no, it's it, anytime we talk about recruitment, I get jazzed up as I've shared with many, shared with you many times on, on this podcast, just 
we've got this amazing organization. We've been given a gift of membership to, for us to be able to be a part of the organization. And there's so many other people that deserve that opportunity. So many more people that should be in this family that frankly weren't asked. It's like a lot of people who don't contribute uh, to the organization, don't donate. Many people say, well, it's because I haven't been asked. Many people who haven't joined the fraternity because they haven't been asked, or I would say haven't been asked in a proper way that gets them excited and frankly educates them on the opportunity. Because I think some people turn down membership in TKE, Alex, because they don't, they don't even understand what the experience is. So they walk right by it and it's this golden, golden opportunity. Yeah. Uh, you're right. 644. I'm looking to get to 750 across TEAK by by Christmas. Um, it's another 106 people. Every new member should be completing the fired up training. That is baseline for me. There's no reason that you can't add or finagle two more hours into your new member education process to get every one of these guys fired up certified. And if that happens, then we're in the realm of, of 1644, like, like Donnie was just talking about. We got over 2000 new members that have been registered as teaks so far this year. So that pool is deep. Um, and yeah, the, the, the Auburn thing, the, the reason I reached out to Auburn and, and wanted to talk to them specifically was because I love our, our friends at USC, right? We go out there, we were out there for a podcast not too long ago. They've been a powerhouse for a very long time. And there's a lot that can be learned from how they do their business. And, and that is probably a good idea for another episode of the Teak Nation podcast. But I think there's a natural inclination to for for people across the country and teach chapters to look at USC and say, oh, we could we could never be that big, right? We can never recruit 50 guys in a year. They've just they they roll out of bed in the morning and they get 50 guys, and that's just not us. In some ways, that's true. I do think that's underselling the work. I know that's underselling the work they put in to recruitment. The guys at Auburn were 15 members six years ago. They were smaller than most of the chapters out there that are probably being represented by the listener base. And now they're getting 50 guys a year. And yes, they're on a big campus. Yes, it's an SEC school, blah, 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 blah. But that is a case study in how you can turn things around and how you can organize, how you can act, how you can strategize to recruit more members. And maybe it's not 50, maybe it's 20, maybe it's 15, but whatever your stretch goal is. But that was a, a very purposeful decision to talk to them specifically, not just because they're the number one recruiting group in Teak right now, but because they seen those dark days and they, the guys on the call were very open and honest about coming into a chapter that lacked direction and that lacked members and doing what they did to turn it around. Very impressive. And if you haven't listened to it, like go listen to it right now. There's, there's no episode of this podcast that we've done that I would recommend higher than that one. We've done a lot of really great episodes. That one to me was the pinnacle uh, as far as the information that was shared that can be directly applied to the things that people are out there doing or trying to do. So go listen to the, the podcast. Um, and I want to keep bringing groups in. That was something a little different we did. Um, certainly not the last time that it will happen. Any other reflections or thoughts on how recruitment has been going this year? We can talk about it for hours. We're off to a strong start. Growth numbers are very, very good, but we've got to keep our foot on the gas. So um, sitting here and celebrating or, you know, pounding our chest to, to all of our membership about how great they have done. I think it's, it's important to reflect upon it and make sure everyone understands we're off to a good start. And I'm very, very proud of the work that's been done, but the, it's not over. A long, long way to go. And there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of, again, folks out there walking around on these college campuses that deserve the opportunity to be a member of the fraternity. And we've got to keep our foot on the pedal and keep being thoughtful and innovative about how we communicate with those folks and also how we engage and build the names list and walk through the process. And that's, you know, if you want to, if you want to be successful, you got to have a process and you got to work that process. Yes, that is, uh, that is all correct. And it's something that we pretty much preach every time we talk about recruitment. So more to come on the uh, recruitment front. That being said, if you've made it this far, you're probably wondering when Donnie was going to talk about the Braves. Could it be right now? I'm happy to, if, you, if you'd like to go well, down I Just a uh, quick, quick baseball update. I'd be yeah, I'd so, talking about the Red Sox. Yeah. So for folks who don't know, or folks who might have interest of, I am a huge sports fan but the team that is the closest to my heart 
uh, are the Atlanta Braves. Grew up as a little kid as a Braves fan, played baseball as my main sport uh, until until really I was a teenager when I started to play golf. A lot of people see me as more of a golfer, played college golf, but um, baseball is really my first love and something that I, you know, we watched baseball games as a kid uh, when I was in North Carolina, growing up on a Marine base. And then we moved back to Indiana. The Braves were on TBS every night. So that obviously made it easy to continue to follow them and watch them. And so uh, something I still do, something that's become a family tradition is that we watch the Braves game almost every single night on TV. It's on. Baseball is a great thing, right? You can kind of go about your evening and still have it on TV. You don't have to be intensely watching every single pitch. But I will say I've lost about 15 years off my life watching baseball in the last uh, three to four weeks as the Braves were heading towards clinching the division in the NL East and then obviously the playoffs. So as we speak right now, we're heading towards game six. We're one win away. But uh, we all, the Braves also blew a 3-1 lead to the Dodgers last year. Luckily, we made up for that and followed through on a 3-1 lead and won in six games this year in the NLCS. But I definitely uh, I definitely would love to see that get wrapped up tonight. So cannot, cannot believe the run. Cannot believe the run the Braves have made. Uh, middle of the year, Ronald Acuna Jr., if you don't know, He's one of the top three or five players in Major League Baseball. Towards ACL, out for the year. Uh, definitely, the Braves were teetering around 500. People thought the season was over. I thought the season was over. And then at the trade deadline, uh, we're able to go acquire four players, uh, Eddie Rosario, Jack Peterson, Jorge Soler, uh, and Adam Duvall, and have really just taken off and been the best team in baseball since then, uh, record-wise, since the All-Star break. So uh, it's been an amazing run. Magical run, and they're one game away. And I would just – nothing would make me happier outside of seeing us just crush all our recruitment goals than to uh, see the Braves get a win tonight and World Series title. Yeah, by the time this uh, podcast airs, either the Braves will have clinched the World Series or we'll be gearing up for game seven. So uh, hopefully the former, and we don't have to uh, stress your game seven. I just hate the Astros, so I'm I'm all aboard the the Braves wagon. Not only did they beat the Red Sox in the ALCS, but they're a bunch of cheaters, as we know. Yes, Jim Crane, owner of the Astros, is a frauder in the bond. Unfortunately, it does not change my feelings on them. Similarly to how frauder Brett Whitner, the chief financial officer uh, of this great fraternity, absolutely despises Aaron Rodgers and the Packers, despite his standing as a member of the fraternity. So it can be. But we love Aaron Rodgers. Let's make we sure love Aaron Rodgers. Well, hey, this is, yeah. this is a pro Aaron Rodgers podcast. Yeah. No, it's just if you haven't had Brett to come on here. There's a reason. Yeah, A-Rod, if you're listening, podcast. we'd love to have you. We love you. We love you. We will, we will not make Brett a part of that. That episode, if you came to the office, we would tell him to stay home that day, right? Like, whatever it takes. Yep. Uh, we'd love, love to have John Wick costume. That was classy, well executed, wonderful. If Aaron Rodgers came to the office, I think Brett would cool his tone a little bit. Oh, he would show a lot of humility really quick. He'd be, he'd be the biggest Aaron Rodgers fan there is. Well, let's not go that far. All right. That's, that's a good point. Um, speaking of, of Aaron Rodgers, how are your fantasy football teams looking? surprisingly uh, stronger than you would expect. If you recall, we'll do, let's do this fast because I know some listeners, this is not necessarily their cup of tea. But when we had our fantasy football draft in our league that has some former staffers and then, frankly, you and I, I don't even know if there's anyone else currently on the staff in that. I was definitely uh, smirked at for some of my draft picks and thought that my team was not going to be as successful. But uh, we're off to a five and three start here for uh, the team of Bob Barr's Ballers, which, you know, that's a fantasy team that I wanted to draw upon the past leaders of the organization. And so got a victory this week over Kyler Instincts, which is Tom McAnich, former hmm. member of the fraternity staff. So we're, we're five and three on a two game winning streak. Feeling good about feeling good about the team. Um, how about you? This is definitely your lane and something that you spend a lot of time and energy on. A lot, yeah, a lot of time and energy. Um, my teams are all pretty average, I would I would say. You know, between between 3.5 and 6.5 out of 10, 
Uh, I have three teams this year and they are all middling. So it's been a rough go. I actually joined the fantasy basketball league this year because I was doing so poorly in fantasy football that I just said, screw it. Let's try basketball. I'm also really, really bad at fantasy basketball. So um, it's been uh, it's been a tough year for fake sports for me, but season's not over yet. Still got some moves to make throwing some trade offers out there, trying to trying to get some some better players on my squad. And uh, we'll see where that carries us. But yeah, uh, I've been uh, I've been impressed with the work that you've been doing so far, Frauder, in the fantasy football realm and uh, just continue to wish you the absolute best of luck moving forward. Appreciate that. I haven't gotten as many questions from friends about fantasy football this year. I don't know if it's because we haven't. You think there's a correlation there? As prominent, well, they have they would have no way of knowing how bad my teams are. So um, it is just weird that the universe has lined up to where, as I struggle at fantasy football, I also have a lack of people asking for advice. Maybe I've taught them so well they don't need it anymore. the 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 mentor, no, the mentee has become the mentor. Whatever. The students become the teacher. I think is yeah. the cleaner way that people use that There's metaphor. More, but yeah, karate kid maybe. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's still it's still good time. Always always enjoy fantasy football. Always enjoy talking fantasy football. So if you're out there and you're interested, hit me up and I'll let you know exactly how not to construct a roster or fantasy basketball. I could be very helpful there as well. All right, we did Teak, we did the Grand Council, we did sports. Is there anything else that we need to cover here on this week's edition of the Teak Nation podcast? I think we've covered a lot of ground. I'm thrilled to be it's back with you. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be back with you on the on the airwaves here and our podcast. And really excited as we go into the holidays of how we finish off this first semester. It's crazy to think, but the semester's almost over. Uh, we'll be, you know, we're basically four weeks till we're into finals for a lot of folks. And they'll be getting ready to go home and, and see their families for the holidays. So uh, we've got to we got to finish the semester off strong. We've got some groups that have been working through some second recruitment. We've got groups who are working through member education, initiating folks, guys who are heading towards December graduation or starting to get towards that job search because they're going to be graduating in the, in the summer in 2022. And also, if there's anyone out there listening in that in that universe. Fraternity is definitely going to be hiring and looking for continued talent. So if that's of interest, reach out to Al and he would love to have a conversation with you about possibly being part of our team. Yeah, uh, that is a great point. I am starting to have some conversations with some individuals who have expressed interest in joining our staff. And if you or someone you know is in that boat, please do reach out because we are looking to bring some team members on and we're going to need to because we have a lot of things going on in the spring in the way of expansion in the way of recruitment growth and we're going to need more people who are who are all in to help us hit our goals so i'm excited to continue those conversations it is one of the more i think enjoyable parts of this job is to have the opportunity to select and train and develop new employees and then send them out and, and see them make a true impact on the fraternity and uh, the more opportunities we have to do that, the better. So it is, it is out there and something to consider if you have not already. All right. Now will be the time to smash the like button. Now will be the time to text a friend and tell them about the Auburn episode. Maybe not even necessarily this episode, um, but you can tell them about both. And then, you know, just, just make sure that you're first in line in two weeks when the next episode of the Teak Nation podcast is made available. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for your time. Appreciate you. Even though Donnie says I don't, I really do. And I just, I just want more of you. That's all I want. So let's make it happen. We'll talk to you again soon. Goodbye.